talk about that today. The, the, the month of July was a really interesting month as we focused in specifically on the area of fellowship and relationships. And uh, how do we deal with some, uh, sometimes when, when uh, and for instance, last week we talked about hypocrites. What do we do when someone we love and we appreciate and is in fellowship with us, they're a believer, but they're doing something hypocritical? What do we do? Is it right for us to confront them? Do we, should we confront them? Well, we talked about that last week. You have to go back and listen to that message. But man, uh, I hope that every week in the month of July that something spoke to you. You can take something, apply it. But I, I'm telling you, I was, I was maybe most convicted over all those messages. I was most convicted this week. <laughs> I spent more time this week on my knees before God, repenting than I did all the month of July because of the subject today. Do I really understand the power of prayer? And really, it's not even the power of prayer. It's the power of God that is released when we pray. Do we understand that? The one thing that will make an impact on every area of your life that I could talk about today would be prayer. I've already uh, quoted to you Acts chapter 242, but let's look at it. Acts 242 says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The early church was devoted to prayer. They devoted themselves to this. They understood this. They knew that Jesus, Jesus had just given them the, the command, go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them, right? Right? And if they were going to accomplish this, they needed the power of the Holy Spirit, and they knew that it was activated as they prayed. How can we read about the experience of the early church as they prayed and then settle for anything less? Is there a part of you that kind of, well, sometimes you're just wondering. You read the book of Acts, and you see how supernatural things happen, and you're like, God, can you do it again today? And the answer is, yes, he can, and he does. Well, do it in my life. Do it in my church. Is there, is there like a holy dissatisfaction in your life? I mean, really, are, are any of you just, man, I just, I want to see more of God in my life. I want to see more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, more of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's activated as we pray, as we humble ourselves before the Lord. The New Testament church in Acts chapter 12, verse 5 uh, it says this, so Peter was kept in prison. One of their leader, their greatest leader, Peter, he's in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him because they believed what James chapter 5 said, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's powerful and it's effective. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm not that righteous. I, I'm, this guy, you got the wrong guy. Uh, you got the wrong girl. I mean, I do my best. I try to follow Christ and all, but... I'm not sure how effective my prayers are. Well, here's the deal. If Jesus Christ is in you, if you've given your life to Christ, if you've invited him in, I got good news for you. Then you are righteous. You've been made righteous through Christ, and your prayers are powerful. My prayers are powerful. Can you say that with me? My prayers are powerful. Now say it like you mean it, will you? My prayers are powerful. Because when I pray, asking the Father in the name of Jesus, God moves. Prayer is not only powerful, but in a real sense, it's prophetic. We've taught about this before. Mark Batterson wrote a tremendous book about this, The Circle Maker. But the idea is this. From Scripture is, is, is when we pray, we are, it's like we're prophesying. This is where our life's going. You know, we pray and we ask God to move and to do things that we're not seeing happen. You know what I'm saying? That's prophetic praying. It's, it's, you can sit around and say, man, I wish my marriage was better. Man, I wish my kids would obey. So tired of them. Man, this job stinks. I wish I could do something different. Or you can say, Lord, 
I thank you that there's a day coming when I'm going to be fulfilled in my job. I thank you for the place you put me right now. I thank you for the grace that I received by faith to stay here. I thank you for my marriage. I thank you for my kids. I thank you that they are going to obey. I thank you that they are learning right now. I thank you for the opportunity to try to help steer them and lead them and guide them to follow you. You pray in faith. You, you pray, you prophesy through prayer. You want to see miracles happen. You want to see the supernatural happen in your life. Prayer is the key. If this is the kind of life we want to lead, we've got to be people of prayer. Most of you know this week was a, um, a, a kind of a transition in the staff, a changing here. And uh, Matt Holloway is, is uh, now f- full-time going to the worship pastor position. And, and, uh, and Megan and I are stepping in to lead the youth staff. And so this Wednesday night is our first Wednesday night to, to step in. And, lead. and I want every student here in high school or middle school, you better not, if, if you're not there next week, I don't care if you've never come before. If you're not there this Wednesday night, I'm going to come after you next Sunday. I'm just going to tell you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point you out. You're going to have to come up on stage. No, uh, all joking aside, but seriously, we want you there. Be there this Wednesday as we kick off a new series called Rhythms. Rhythms. Let's get into the rhythm of spending time in the Word, spending time uh, in prayer. Let's, what's it look like to be in a rhythm? As, as we get back into school, get back into the swing, let's get into a rhythm of serving Him and living for Him. It's going to be awesome. But listen, I don't want to just see young people that are good kids. I don't want this church just to have good kids. Oh, they're just good kids. Oh, that's such a good family. Oh, that's such a good church. I want godly kids. I want Christ-like kids. I want to raise up, and we want to see discipled in this church, young men and women that are Christ-like, families that are Christ-like. We want a church that is Christ-like. There's enough good people in this community, but good isn't enough. You won't stand before God someday and say, you know what? I was pretty good. And God said, oh, you're pretty good. Come on in. No. Did we follow Christ? Did we put him first? That's what we want to see happen. And if that's going to happen, let me tell you, the enemy is not just going to sit there and roll over. The devil's real. Satan's real. He's not just going to sit there and say, Okay, if you guys want to do that, she wins. No, he's going to fight every step of the way, just like he's already been fighting. But we know this, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen? Amen. There's a battle going on. There's a war going on. And we as a church need to step it up in the area of prayer. Very interesting. As, As we look to Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says this, look. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Stop right there. They'd they'd seen Jesus open the eyes of the blind. They'd seen Jesus do the miracle of the loaves and the fish. I mean, imagine if if one of them was like... uh, that was kind of cool, Jesus. How would you do that? I mean, they didn't ask, uh, Jesus, how did you heal those people? How do you, now, how do you go about raising dead people, Jesus? Could you help me with that one? You know, uh, hey, Jesus, um, you know, um, Matthew and I were thinking about opening up a business on the side, maybe a little restaurant business. How would you do that whole multiplication of the bread? <laughs> thinking about how that might help the bottom line. Like, we'll call it Jesus Multiplies or something like it would be a great name for a restaurant, Jesus. Uh, if The bread and, and the fish. How would you multiply that? We'd kind of like to do a little something, something on the side here. No, 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 no. There's none of that. Because they knew where the power came from was when Jesus pulled away and spent time in prayer with the Father. And it's no less for you and for me. If we want to see the power of God in our families, in our marriages, in our daily lives, if you really are serious about God using you to touch lost people with the love of Jesus, then we've got to pray. We've got to believe God. The New Testament church, they were a praying group, but not only that, Jesus was a praying group. In fact, Matt already talked about um, Jesus' baptism, but did you ever catch this in Luke chapter 3, verse 21? Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, 
I've done a lot of baptisms, but I'm not quite sure I've ever done a baptism where someone was praying in the midst of their baptism. Jesus prayed all the time. What happened then? The heavens were opened. Do you want an open heaven over your life? Can I just encourage you? What is it, August 18th? Get water baptized and start praying and believe God to do the supernatural in your life. You want to see it happen? Pray. Jesus gave himself to prayer before big decisions. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, In these days he went out to the mountain to what? To pray. And Luke 5, 16, as the crowd started getting larger and larger and larger, what did he do? He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Getting ready to reveal his identity, who he really was. Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, verse 18, now it happened that he was praying alone. The disciples were with him, and he asked him, who do the crowd say that I am? Luke 9, 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. Mark chapter 1, 35, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus gave himself to prayer. Have you given yourself to prayer? Have we as a church really given ourselves to prayer? Prayer is the key to supernatural power of God filling our lives. So what can we learn from this passage? We look at this passage in Luke, and and it's what we call the Lord's Prayer, but it's kind of the the Lord's Prayer light. (laughs) Because there's, and as you study this, it looks as if there's two times when Jesus taught some of these same principles. There was another time in Matthew where he taught it, and he expanded it. There's, there's a whole uh, bunch more of the Lord's Prayer um, as he was teaching. And here it's just kind of the shorter version as he was teaching here. For whatever reason, he didn't go into as much detail. So we might jump back and forth between the two. But some of you, you grew up in maybe more liturgical churches or different churches than ours, and, and maybe you started or ended. I remember we had a Lutheran friend that attended here for years and years and years, and on his yellow card week after week, Uh, When are we going to say the Lord's Prayer? Uh, When are we going to say the Lord's Prayer? Uh, When are we going to say the Lord's Prayer? And and I understand, and I don't think there's anything wrong with stating the Lord's Prayer. It's Scripture. Pray it. That's that's good. But I use it as a prayer guide often. But when Jesus was, was teaching them this, it was more, this is how you pray, not so much pray this exact words. So we can talk about that more some other time because I really, what I want to do is I want to look at this passage. What are some helpful hints that we can pull out? What are some things we can extrapolate from this passage to help encourage us to pray and to pray effectively and powerfully? Well, here's the first thing. Grab your notes, grab a pen, fill this in. Number one, get connected to the Father. Get connected to the Father. In Luke chapter 11, verse 2, he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Let me teach you something here. Is it wrong for you and I to pray to the Holy Spirit? Is it wrong for you and I to pray to Jesus? Wrong? I don't think so. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think so. But... It's good that we would follow a pattern that we see Jesus praying. In fact, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Another time when Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer. John chapter 16, verse 23, in that day you'll be asking nothing of me. Truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba. Galatians 4, 6, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Um, Luke eleven two, 2, when you pray, Father, hallowed be thy name. Verse 13, if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven? Uh, so what are you saying, Scott? Uh, when, when I, what my encouragement to you would be, just practical, when you pray, let's pray to the Father. When you pray, um, whether you're praying over the dinner meal, whether you're praying with your family, whether you're praying in the life group, our, my, my teaching, oh, excuse me, teaching of Scripture would be, as you pray, start with the Father. Say, Heavenly Father, we've, or how, Father, however you want to say it, but we start with the Father because that's who we're praying to. Um, why is that so important? 
Well, I, I would say that maybe even beyond just um, the, using the verbiage of the Father, um, let me back up just one more step and just make sure you understand. We believe in the Trinity, uh, right? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So really, when you pray to one, you're really praying to all. I mean, they're all God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But okay, so, so we pray to the Father, but even more than that, get to know the Father. Understand who the Father is. It's important positionally in how we pray that we see God as our Father. In fact, some of you struggle in prayer because you're too focused on prayer and not on the Father, not on spending time with your Father, not on spending time with God. If you want to grow in prayer, don't focus on prayer. (laughs) Get to know the Father. It's kind of like uh, if you're driving today, you're going to drive, you're going to be sitting in the car, you're driving along. If all you did, this is the steering wheel, by the way. If all you did, you're driving along, and all you did was stare at the windshield. There's the windshield right there. And you're like, man, that was a big one. That was a bug. That was a... And all you're, all you're seeing, what's going to happen? If all you look, you're looking forward, you're looking the right way, but your focus is all on the windshield. What's going to happen? You're going to end up in the ditch. Because you, you need to look through the windshield to where you're going, right? To what's out there. That's why you, some of you, when, when you're, you, you struggle with prayer because you're just, how can I be a better prayer? I want to pray. No, be looking for the Father, spending time with your Father, spending time with God, spending time in God's presence, just communing, talking with Him, communicating with Him, and He giving you a sense back in your heart. Look through and connect with the Father. It's so important we see God as our Father. Why? Because some of us, we see Him as an employer. I mean, think about this. What do you mean? Well, you tell God, God, I did this for you. God, you got to understand, I did all this work for you. God, I, I came to church on Sundays. God, I went to life group. God, I passed the offering bag. And you should have seen it, God. I passed the offering bag, passed the notes. Bag notes, bag notes, bag notes. Have you ever watched those ushers? They're amazing. <laughs> I worked for you, Jesus. So therefore, I deserve you to answer my prayers. Some of you, when you pray, you see, now I'm all about holding God to his word. Don't get me wrong. But for some of you, you see God more as an employer. I work for you, you work for me. Come on. It's a great team. Others of you, you see God as a computer. And you just type something in, you save it. It's saved on the hard drive. This is my prayer. This is my thought. This is my thing. It's saved. Now I trust you to do it. And you never come back to it again because you know you saved it. It's in, it's in the hard drive. It's on the, it's on the hard drive. You're good to go. Uh, you'd never even think to go back and revisit that and bring that up persistently before the Lord. Some of you, um, you would think of God as a genie. It's like, if I can just rub my Bible three times, one, two, three, and just like Aladdin, um, uh, you know, the the genie jumps out and says, I'll grant you three wishes. Uh, uh, The only thing is I can't do is make someone fall in love with you. you, you 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 see God as a genie. He's your good luck charm. He's your Santa Claus. When you see God as your father, here's the difference. You see yourself as the child. Uh, Scott, I'm 75 years old. I'm no child. Oh, yes, you are. You're a child of Almighty God. You're a daughter of Almighty God. You're a son of Almighty God. It doesn't matter age here. Every one of us, we're children. Just put yourself in the shoes of when your kids were little or when you were little. Children know that mothers and fathers do a lot of things they don't understand. And they might not like it, but they'll get over it quickly and there's very little suspicion. They just know sometimes adults do what I want them to do and that's fine. I mean, for instance, right now, if, if, if you had a young child with you and you were holding their hand and you went out to US 20, just walk out the driveway here, and, and you just, and that child held your hand, I'm guessing more than likely if they have your hand and you start leading them to walk across US 20, they're going to trust you. They're going to be like, oh, mom, dad, okay, I'm with mom, I'm okay, I'm with dad. I mean, there could be like a, 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 a semi coming this way and, a, and, and um, uh, some other, like uh, something else coming, th- and, and, and you're just putting yourself in peril. But that, what's going to happen? Because that little kid just has a, a, just a sense of, 
My, my mother, my father knows what they're doing, so I'm going to trust them. You get what I'm saying? But, but what, we, what we need to, to have is that kind of a childlike faith. The problem is life happens. And we get all these times when all of a sudden we're like, God, where were you? God, I don't understand why you didn't move. God, I prayed and it didn't. I just, and you get all this stuff happening that all of a sudden your childlike faith turns into, uh, I, don't, I, 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 I believe in you, God, and I want to trust you, but sometimes I struggle. You know what? God's calling us back to that childlike faith where we just, we just trust that he knows what's best and that he's going to take care of it. And, and, and sometimes uh, fathers do make decisions that we may never understand, but we can trust him. It's like um, one time, um, I don't remember why Megan wasn't with us, but I think my oldest Ashton was like two years old, and she's in the back seat in the car seat, and I'm there, and it's time to eat, so we're looking for some good nourishing food. We're in the drive-thru of McDonald's, And I rolled down the window, you know, hit the button, bzzz, and I'd like a da, 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 ketchup only. It's the best way to eat a hamburger. And, um, and so I just, I just give him my order, whatever. And I get all the way through the order, and I'm like, anything else you'd like with that order? And from the back seat, two year old Ashton says, and a pop! <laughs> Actually, she couldn't say the first piece. She said, and a bop! And I'm thinking, you don't need a bop! Moms and dads need bops because they have two year olds. And someday when we put on a little weight, we'll get a diet bop, but you're not getting a bop. Of course, we did not get her a bop at two years old. Why? Because she can't, she, two-year-old don't need a bop. Fathers know best, right? Mothers know best. It, and, and, and do you know, I think she might have said, well, I like that, but it was done. There was no suspicion. Do you know, in that childlike, okay, dad said it. Oh, sure, some of your kids may even have more of a determination and be more dog-headed, and they're going to scream and cry for the next 5, 10, 20 minutes, 5 days, but they'll get over it. <laughs> no, seriously, you think about that. Kids, kids are like, okay, if you think so, all right, I, don't, I wish I could do that, but okay. And what if, what if we took that kind of an outlook on the Father, the Heavenly Father? It's like, I don't understand, I don't like this. I don't like the way this is looking, God, but you're the father, and I'm going to trust you. When you see God as your father, it changes how you respond in prayer. Um, when we get to the point where we can pray and keep praying and trusting God, knowing he hears us, and keep trusting his timing, keep trusting his will, even when we don't see the, uh, the answer that we want, that's faith. That's childlike faith. That's resting in him. Let's go to number two. I've got to keep moving. Prayer is the key to seeing God's will accomplished. Wait a minute, Scott. Uh, I, I appreciate your confidence in me, but you know what? The big guy's the big guy, and I'm not. I know that. I mean, there's some of you, you don't pray because you're just like, uh, God, whatever you want to do is fine. Just, you know, have at it. You're God, I'm not. God's going to do whatever he wants to do, anywho. You know, why would the Lord say when he's teaching the disciples to pray, um, to pray even specifically for the Lord's will to be done? Uh, in fact, when you, when you look in Scripture, um, uh, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. If we jump over to the Matthew time when he taught on this, pray then like this, Matthew 6, 9 uh, ver, uh, through two ten. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Powerful prayer doesn't say, my kingdom come, my will be done. No, it says, God, I want your will, your desire, I want my life to line up with the heavenly design, God's will, God's desire. Now, you've heard me teach on this before, but let me hit it just real quick. Psalm 37, verse 4 through 5. Look at this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. Okay, delight yourself in the Lord. So what this means is put Christ first, put him first in your life, his desires, his way. And you know, sometimes there are certain things that pop into my heart. I'm like, man, I just so want to see that happen. So what's this verse look like lived out? What I do is I take that desire of my heart and I pray it like nobody's business. It might be the craziest thing in the world. 
It might be something that's just out there. I just start praying it, praying it, praying it. And you know what I, I, don't, what I trust is that if, as I'm praying, if I'm starting to get out of the will of God, and the will of God's here, and here's my prayer, I'm just trusting the Holy Spirit's going to bring me back in. You know, there's been crazy stuff I've prayed for. And let me just toss this out. I'd encourage every one of you to find time in your day to spend time, not only in the Word, but send, spend time in prayer. Find a time in your day um, where you, you are, hey, God, this is our time. Driving to work, um, uh, maybe uh, as you're drinking your morning coffee, um, uh, maybe before you unwind at night. Some of you moms uh, who are stay-at-home moms, you work at home, really. I mean, you've you're, you got kids around you nonstop. I'd encourage you to try to find time even yourself if it means that your husband's got to be on uh, step in and do something extra. Just find time to spend with just you and your father. But here's the other thing. is My encouragement is some of you won't get this because I'm way too old, but take the phone off the hook and leave it off the hook. And, and what I mean is like, pick it up, say, hey, good morning, Jesus. I mean, I, I try to make a point of before my feet hit the floor, out of my bed, I say, Heavenly Father, I invite you into this day. Come, lead me, guide me. If I can, if at that point in the morning, if my mind is good enough to think through a few, I'll pray over my day. Whatever. But before I even get out of bed, I take the phone off the hook and I don't ever hang it up. I mean, and, and what, 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 this is the phone, by the way. You think I'm just hang loose. No, I'm, I got the phone here. I got the phone Take it off the hook, because all throughout my day, one, one time I was just thinking about a time when, when, when God knew what was best. I think there's a country song that says, I thank God for unanswered prayers or something like that. I think I pray, I, I'm, that's like a theme song for me, because I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm just trying to encourage you to do the exact same thing. Like every part of your day, throughout your day, you see something, just pray about it. You start feeling anxious about something, pray about it. You see something that needs to happen, you think about, Lord, I just pray for that person. I pray for that situation. I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray. And I remember one time, this was years ago, we, I saw this car. We were in the, in the, almost in the time of needing another car, and I knew that was coming up. I, oh, I saw this. Oh, and sometimes I'm a sucker for a good car, a good deal, you know, especially if we're in the market. And I'm like, oh, I, I love the chase, you know, of finding the right one. And, and I saw this one. Our neighbors had it. It was down the street from us, driving by it every day. I was like, Lord, I pray you give us that. I pray you give us some money. And, and, I, and this made it, it, it was even harder because we actually had the cash that we could have paid cash at that moment for that car. Like, oh, we could pay, we got cash. God, I pray that. We prayed and prayed and prayed. And you know, I just, I never, uh, it was a desire of my heart every time I drove by, but then I just couldn't, I just couldn't. I didn't even talk to Megan about it. I was like, it was, I so wanted it, but at the same time, I didn't. you know, it was soon after that that we ended up getting a completely other vehicle, and it was such a better deal, such a better position, such a, such a, it lasted so much longer than the other one would have. The other one was high mileage, blah, blah, blah. but I'm just telling you, God knew that, and, and as I was praying and I submitted that to the Lord, the Lord changed the desires of my heart. It happened to be a minivan, and any young family in here, a young couple, just know it's in your future. Um, <laughs> two words, stow and go. <laughs> Come on. You could say, I'm going to drive a pickup truck the rest of my life. I'm, I'm not going to have an SUV. No, you are. You're going to have a minivan. Get ready. You need one. And that's what it was. God supplied. And I, I'm talking silly stuff. But really, I throw it out there. Toss it out there. Give it to the Lord. For some of you, it's something a lot more serious like relationships and friendships. There's some friendships that you need to tune out of your life because they're not drawing you closer to Christ. In fact, for some of you, it may be even farther along. You're dating some. I'm not prophesying over any couple here today, but you're dating someone. Maybe you're in a relationship with someone, and, um, and you just, they're not going the same way that you're going with the Lord. They're kind of going this way, and, they're, and it could be even just in life. There's two different directions. They're all about career, 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 and you're all about something different. And it's not so much that either one's wrong. It's just, and so what you need to do is, Pray, 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 and if it's in your heart to stay with God, I pray that you would, and if it's, that this, that this would come about, but if this isn't your will, then Lord, I submit to it and show me how to deal with this. I just toss it out to you. Um, we we, we want to see the Lord's will be done. Let's go to number three. Number three. Get connected to the Father. Prayer is the key to seeing God's will accomplished. Number three, prayer is concerned about others as well as ourselves. I never saw this. In the Lord's Prayer, 
I never saw this. And I've, I preached the Lord's Prayer. I've broke it down even further than what I'm doing today. I did a whole series once on the Lord's Prayer. I never noticed this. But notice verse um, 3. Here it says, give us, give who? Us. Each day our daily bread. Forgive, verse 4, forgive what? Us. Our sins. And for we also forgive everyone who sins against us us and lead us not into temptation. Wow. Have you ever noticed in the Lord's Prayer that it's an us, it's a we, there's a together thing here? Um, Scott, why do you take so much time on a Sunday morning? You open the service with prayer. At the end of the worship time, you pray, and you want us to pray with you. And and I, he sometimes even tell us to pray out loud. I'm not going to do that. I just, I'm not gonna, I, and, and then at the end, I just, just when you think we're done, we got to pray again. And I just got, I'll tell you why we do that. Because the Lord says we should over and over. And, and there's something about when we come together and us, we pray together. It's not just about me and myself. It's, it's about us. It recognizes the community, the community. The fellowship, Acts 2.42, the fellowship. It recognizes us together, lead us. It recognizes the community of believers. And I know, in, in, um, I'm, I'm no sociologist, but in the Western world, even Western Christianity, we tend to really focus on ourselves. I, I invite Jesus into my heart, and I, and I get that, and I think it's right and all, but at the, at the same time, there's something to the community of believers that we miss out. We need each other. It's about more than just myself. God will answer and he'll bring strength to us all. There's something powerful about a church that believes this, a life group, a church that carries one another's burdens and prays and believes together. Charles Spurgeon, one of the great preachers in the 1800s, he said this quote, it's in your notes or on the screen. The condition of the church may be very accurately gauged by its prayer meetings. So is the prayer meeting a grace-o-meter And from it we may judge of the amount of divine working among a people. If God be near a church, it must pray. And if he be not there, one of the first tokens of his absence will be a slothfulness in prayer. As you and I pray, God moves. As you and I pray, I'm not not negating and taking away anything from your own personal prayer time. But I'm just telling you, something supernatural happens when God's people come together and begin to pray. It's not either or, it's both and, because prayer is not just about ourselves. Let's keep going. Helpful hint number four, there's power in persistent prayer. Here's Jesus giving them a template for prayer, an example of prayer. Here's how you pray. Now let me tell you more about an attitude of prayer. Look at verse five. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Stop right there for a second. Why is someone getting someone else up in the middle of the night for something as silly as this? Now, of course, this is a parable. Jesus is sharing this story. Uh, it's like, why don't you just go down to Harding's? I think they're open at least till nine. Uh, why, why don't you drive into Goshen? I'm sure that Walmart's open 24 hours or something like that. I mean, we, we have all these, all these things. Oh, man, Walmart. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I completely forgot. I was going to pray today for the tragedy that happened in, in Texas. Can we just take a moment right now? If you aren't aware, there was shooting that happened there, shooting happened in Ohio, and I was gonna pray today in our prayer time, completely spaced it. Can we just, it's a message on prayer. Can we do that? This wasn't, Heavenly Father, we just take a moment right now and hit pause. Even as I said the word Walmart, I was reminded of, of people yesterday that were just going to maybe buy school supplies, buy stuff at Walmart in, uh, I believe it was El Paso, Texas, and and uh, 20 of them lost their lives. And so, God, I, I just pray for all the family. I pray for all those involved right now. We just agree together right now, practicing what we're preaching right now. We're praying together, asking, Lord, that, that somehow, some way, you would take this tragedy and turn it for good. I pray many people would find peace and solace in your hands and your arms today. God, we just rest in you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But why would someone in the middle of the night, well, let me just tell you, hospitality was huge in this culture. And for you to have a friend stop in unannounced and not have food to feed him would be like the ultimate no-no. 
And so he goes to his neighbor in this, in this story, says, knocks on, hey, hey, listen. Oh, you got, and it wasn't just one loaf of bread. Did you notice that? How many? It was three. I mean, it's the middle of the night, but it's like, we want to be generous. We don't just want one loaf. We want to be generous with this friend. Now look what happens, verse seven. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. Shh. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. If you've ever had kids, you know the seriousness of that request. (laughs) My kids are sleeping, finally. It took forever. And then uh, verse eight, look at it. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him the friend. uh, Though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he'll get up and give him as much as he needs. Because of his impudence is what the ESV says. Because of his persistence, because of his nerve, because of his gall. I mean, really, even persistence maybe doesn't capture the whole idea of this. The the persistence, it's, it's because he's in my face and he won't get out of my face. Listen, I've studied this all week. And I've heard more than one commentator um, point to the fact that persistence might be, uh, boldness might be just a little understating what Jesus is trying to teach here. I mean, Jesus is trying to teach persistence, but yeah, in your face, I, I, I'm not leaving till I get what I came here for. That's the audacity of the one petitioning. Think about that. What's, what you see here is almost a feeling of, I can't believe I'm doing this for you. <laughs> I mean, my kids are already in bed. We're all hunkered down. We got the covers, the heat's underneath the covers. It's just perfect, you know, and, and oh, okay. And he gets up and he gives the guy the bread. He's like, I can't believe it. I, I think every, when you think about the fatherhood of God as a parent, have you ever found yourself doing something for your kids saying, I can't believe I'm doing this. I mean, your kids have just been persistent. I'm not talking something wrong or sinful, but I'm just talking, I think every dad, every mom in this room is like, there's times when you've like, I can't. Now, grandparents, I understand. I'm not one, but I understand as grandparents, it's so much even easier to just give in. But for parents, can you just remember those times when when you don't, you're like, I I can't believe, no, no, I don't want to do it. No, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do it. Okay, I'll do it. The thing about my kids, especially my youngest two, um, Tate and, and Hayden, when, when that finally happens, they typically like to grab my phone and take a picture of it. So we had, I, I've had them help me with my message today. They created a couple of these. Take a look at this first one. <laughs> because I love them. And then there's another one. That was Williamsburg, Virginia. It's the mom. Yeah. How about this one? I don't know if you can see that, but... It stuck right to the bald. It stuck to the bald. This last one, I, I barely remember this, but <laughs> yeah, that's me underneath there. Why, why would I ever allow my kids to, why would I give in to this request? It was a persistent request. And you know what the truth is? I love my kids. I mean, it. Have you ever thought of God the Father that way? I mean, most of us, we're more likely to think God's really not interested that much. I mean, he's got a lot of things going on up there. But I want you to get something today. God wants you to know today that's the kind of love he has for you. And he wants to answer your prayer request. He wants to say, say yes, um, so I say to you, ask. Look at that, verse 9. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. Them. To him who knocks, the door will be opened. You know, the, the idea is ask and keep asking. He's not annoyed. In, in, that, in that parable, that guy was annoying. And that's really what it's saying. He got in the neighbor's face. And I'm going to tell you, God is not offended by your persistent prayer. God is not offended by your bold in your face. I am not leaving these altars. I am not leaving this prayer request until I see you move. Listen, I know there are times, and we'll get to this in number five. We're not there yet, but we'll get to this. 
where you just got to step back and say, God, I'll never understand this and I rest in your will. But don't let those times when the end product wasn't what you were praying for, don't let that diminish any truth of the word of God that God, this is God answers prayers. And he's a good father and he desires to hear from you. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of his willingness. Ooh, let me say that again. Can you put that on the screen if it's available? Maybe I didn't put it in there. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of his willingness. It's faith. Number five and final. As you pray, rest in the fact that God will do what is best. What is best. The problem is I'm not a good Christian, Scott. I'm not very spiritual. Listen, is Jesus Christ in you? Have you been born again? Have you given your life to Christ? Have you been following Christ? Then uh, God wants to move through you in your prayers. Look at verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Can you imagine you're cooking fish up for your kids? Hey, kids, we're going to have a fish fry. <laughs> and you plate up a snake and put it in their face. Ah, I got you. No, you wouldn't do that. Hey, kids, you know, it's Easter. No greater way to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior than hiding eggs. But instead of hiding eggs, what do you hide? Little scorpions? all over the house, and your kids got their little baskets tumbling around, like, oh, I think there's one under here. Mommy! As a, uh, put on, uh, of course you wouldn't do that. Your kids opening the Christmas gift slowly, wondering what wonderful gift that might be, and a boa constrictor jumps out and wraps it around. Them. Of course you're not going to do that. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give it? And just think of that principle. God will do what is best. We pray. We pray our heart out. We pray with all the faith in the world. And we rest in him. And say, Lord, I prayed. I'm trusting you, and I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to annoy you with my prayers. And Jesus, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is like, bring it on. I'm going to annoy you with my prayers. I'm going to come boldly, persistently. I'm going to come, I'm going to pray, I'm going to leave it in your hands. And I'm going to rest that you know what's best in my life. I'm going to pray prayer of surrender, and I give it to you, Father. I really don't want to pray a prayer of surrender, Scott. Because if I do, what if he sends me to Africa? What if he sends me to the inner city? Worse yet, what if he sends me to the West Coast? Oh, I forgot. I forgot. You know, I visited there a couple years ago. It's not as bad as you'd think. But, you know, trust God. I mean, trust God as you pray. Just rest in him. Worship.